welcome to our first presentation for California Bullet Train. And as always, we thank Steve. Um, you know, you've been so generous with your time. I don't even know how many years you've we were trying to yeah, we were participated. About it. Probably at least six. four, five, six. Well, when, how long have you been doing it? Because we were here at eight. the beginning. Uh, we've been doing is it eight years? Eight. And you were our original partner, so, so eight. Um, wow. <laughs> you know, we, we realized that uh, how busy you are, and obviously, I know Camden and Steve would like to be here as well. Um, yeah. So can I, and I can I just interrupt you and say sure. something about that? So Steve is at is actually with his high speed rail partner right now in the meeting, um, and. Couldn't be here. Camden was intending to at least call in and listen, and then in the world of our consulting world, he had a client need something, and I think he's like on the road with yeah. with one of them. Um, my my intent is to, well, we're hoping they'll watch the video, but at the very least, we're going to go through your presentation, and so I will sort of add their feedback to Great. our to the evaluation. Wonderful. Um, so you get kind of their expertise as well. Great. So, Super. Thank you. Anyway. Above and beyond the logistics, we just want to say thank you. Um, you really have been a, a stalwart partner for us, and it is, um, it's, it's really been a wonderful experience. We want to continue on this experience going forward, so thank you so much. With no further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our high speed rail team. Uh, thank you for the time. Um, my name is Justin Carter. I'm a uh, junior here. I'm studying law history and culture, minoring in psychology. And uh, when we approach this project, we approach it with the, the goal of um, examining every aspect of the project and trying to formulate some uh, possible solutions to, to make this happen. Um, so right now, California faces a bunch uh, troubles on a bunch of different fronts. Um, obviously, there's climate, um, there's political, um, there's um, uh, developmental and uh, um, high-speed rail addresses all of these, and uh, it's it's what you would call a silver silver bullet. And uh, Collins Dictionary defines a silver bullet as any simple but sweeping solution to a very complex or virtually insurmountable problem. So based on this definition, the high-speed rail is even better than one because it wouldn't only, it would not only solve one long-standing problem, but many simultaneously. In particular, it has the potential to link important city economies and catalyze economic development, facilitate regional integration and cohesion, and improve the efficiency of a complete multi-level transportation system. It really is the deal of the century, offering up major solutions with only one investment, with the population growing towards 50 million near the year 20, 2040, it's time for California to get serious and build the future while permanent, permanently solving our problems. So in terms of the economic development, one thing it does is it immediately creates jobs, and we've seen that already. Um, uh, with just the work of the initial operating section, it's already putting thousands of Californians to work. Uh, all folks in the Central Valley, which has been hit particularly hard by the, uh, the recession, um, the, the construction industry there has been uh, facing over 30% unemployment and over the next five years high-speed rail construction is projected to create 20,000 construction jobs annually um, and those jobs are going to go to the people who need them most uh, providing a significant boost to, California, to the California economy as a whole. Um, so building phase one, the blended system, will generate an additional 66,000 jobs annually for 15 years. And it'll create jobs in the construction industry, but it'll also uh, promote, produce growth in several other sectors throughout the wider economy. Uh, permanent public and private sector employees will be responsible for operating and maintaining the high-speed rail system. Um, and uh, further than that, uh, from train operators and maintenance yard workers to station managers, um, operation planners and engineers working on the development of the high-speed rail trains. Um, high-speed rail is going to create permanent California jobs that will always remain in the state. Um, also, uh, it has the it, uh, great ability to attract knowledge and service intensive industry and spur economic activities in the large edge, edge cities, predominantly San Francisco and LA which are the uh, main centers of business uh, along, the, along the rail right now. Um, overall, the impact 
the, the hackney rail is probably going to be more redistributive than generative, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the net overall benefits um, can't be more spatial redistributive in the form of strengthening the global competitiveness uh, of the state with many different associated spillover benefits. Um, so overall, this doesn't need to be a zero-sum game. The knowledge and service-based firms and workers shifting from somewhere uh, to more accessible, higher density and high amenity hubs like a downtown LA or San Francisco could generate net increases in wealth and economic growth that benefits the state at large. Furthermore, if um, with the development of the high-speed rail stations, the economic advances, uh, ad advantages of tourist-oriented clusters um, in large intermediate cities uh, will be very profound. California already has um, a great tourist uh, economy and brings in a lot of money through that, so <coughs> offering up a way that for tourists to excessively move from throughout the state would benefit this greatly. Um, so in terms of regional integration and cohesion, which is perhaps the most important, um, in, my, in my idea, the most important of the benefits, right now America is facing the twin problems of urban disinvestment and suburban sprawl, opposite sides of the same misdirected growth problem. Um, luckily, the urban revitaliz revitalization movement from the high-speed rail is already underway city after city. Uh, sprawl is already a huge problem in California with about 70% uh, of the population living there requiring endless driving to, uh, by everyone to fulfill their basic daily needs. So does high-speed rail facilitate regional integration or, or wide territorial disparity? That's uh, a, a great question. And so on the, on the one hand, uh, high-speed rail is the, a good potential to affect urban space development typologies due to this connectivity to the city centers. And on the other hand, the inner city linkages have become increasingly important to enhance the socioeconomic restructuring across regions in the most developed countries. And this is done through the development of a transit-oriented development uh, format, which I believe is going to be talked about later. Um, and very lastly, um, overall, it's, it's going to create a more complete transportation system. So trains outperform both flying in every measure, capacity, mobility, speed, safety, cost, efficiency, energy consumption. Uh, so a network of high-speed trains can carry more passengers than cars and airplanes combined using a fraction of the energy and with no delays. So as the nation, or as the, as the state contemplates um, a major infrastructure investment, it's important to look at the complete transportation system at all scales and distances. So if you look at this graph, um, you can see that an integral part of, of a complete system, high-speed rail, will carry out the bulk of the capacity. Um, the addition of high-speed rail to California's transportation mix would remake it into a complete system with high-speed rail filling the middle range of passenger trips and cars kept covering the most efficient range under 100 miles. Um, but like all things, this isn't possible without, um, without money. And it's, our, it's already obviously rising a lot already, but when you look at it, the grand scheme of things with what it would cost to um, improve the, infra the current infrastructure, expanding on highways and airports, um, you see that high-speed rail is definitely a good solution, but like all things, we need some money. Yeah, so my name is Armand Najim, sophomore here. Um, so how do we get this thing funded? Because that's one of the biggest problems that we're facing. So right now, the Central Valley section, which is already underway, it's from around Bakersfield to like Merced, it has almost no risk of not being completely funded. Estimates have that at around like $9 billion. And we already received $9 billion for sure from the original Prop 1A, which allocated uh, around $9.5 billion of taxpayer money. And we also got $3.5 billion, billion from the federal government, which we have used $3 billion from. And we have uh, cap and trade proceeds. And the cap and trade program is one which the government sets a cap on carbon emissions and then sells to companies who go over that. And that generates around $500 million a year. Uh, the only volatile funding for the Central Valley comes with the federal funding, which the Trump organization has threatened to pull back the money. But that is not guaranteed, and even if that does happen, which I don't believe it will, uh, Prop 1A and Cap and Trade can fill the gap for the Central Valley section. 
So what are our problems going forward? So the estimates are now reaching 80 to 100 billion. They're all over the place, but somewhere between that range right now. Um, so the central buy section is around 10 billion. In terms of like money that we have right now, we're at a 13 to 14 billion. So as you can see, there's a very large gap that we need to fill. And in the original funding plan, it was so that Prop 1A would fill one third of the funding, federal would be one third, and private would be one third. Federal only gave us three billion, and the private only has given us nothing. And there's like very little interest as of now. And there's no foreseeable way to get a large private investor. So that is one hurdle that we're going to have to overcome. So what can we do? Well, we can look to the large private investor or hope for the large federal fund. And that may happen, and that will bring a lot of benefits. But in the meantime, we can't just be sitting around doing nothing, waiting for that to happen. So what can we be doing now? Well, if we start rethinking what this high-speed rail is, right now it's some big mega project that's supposed to go from San Francisco to LA, it's supposed to benefit Silicon Valley, all the people, all the population in LA. But what it's really meant to do is, like Justin mentioned, a lot of economic benefits, a lot of uh, social benefits, and these benefits come in the city. So we should really start focusing locally, kind of bring the scale down, and that way we can incentivize private funding on a local level. Uh, it's more accessible as people can see the direct benefit and they're not waiting for the long term, like 20, 30 years, to see the benefit of what's going on. And an integrative approach between cities and state government will ease a lot of tension right now. Because right now, as this, it is like a big project, it's kind of like Newsome kind of putting it on the population. There is a bit of a, a understanding that this is not benefiting like America, this is all like a ploy for Silicon Valley. So if you kind of bring it down, bring it more locally, uh, you can kind of get the political support back up. So what would this look like in reality? So the main focus of this, like Justin mentioned, are the thoroughly planned stations in each city. I think these should be the focus of the high-speed rail. In each city, these stations can become like transportation hubs and, and incentivize private uh, economic growth, such as shopping centers. It can like uh, incentivize new transportation <coughs> infrastructure to kind of allocate from that transportation hub to different parts of the city. And it can really grow the urban growth in those cities. What that will also do is protect the farmland as if we kind of grow uh, urban in the urban uh, city, we can kind of cap it so it doesn't reach over into the uh, rural farmland. And because that is a big risk for uh, the high speed rail, in that people believe that the land of the agriculture will be plowed into. Also, how do we plan this so it's not as corrupt and like it's not, we don't make the same mistakes that we're making now? I would say we start creating subcommittees. And in those subcommittees, you have members from the High Speed Rail Authority, you have members from the city government, you have local private uh, investors, all a part of that committee. So that way it's much more stable, it's much more accessible, and people can see the direct, uh, they can like, reach uh, the, their representatives if they need to. Also, each city is different, as we can tell, and each city has different needs. So a one-size-fits-all approach, which the High Speed Rail is trying to kind of do right now, um, it's not fully working out. With this, uh, we would probably need a much improved eminent domain system, so that would be the uh, job of the local and state government as uh, eminent domain right now. It, cities in California do have the power, governments do have the power to use it, but it's very easy to get past that and kind of push back against it, so that may need some improvement going forward. And lastly, I want to say, it's uncertainty should be its strength. Right now, we have almost no plan. Uh, we're kind of sitting around doing nothing and kind of people, it's easy to push back against it. But if we start building small scale regionally and we start building like um, all, all up and down the map, you kind of start moving forward and you gain momentum. And it doesn't have to be a master plan that fi figures it all out in the beginning. Like for example, the LA Metro, which started back in 1990, but was, has been planned for a little before that. They didn't plan like the blue line from uh, LA to Santa Monica, which just happened in like 2016. They kind of worked with certain regions, built that, and then saw that these regions could benefit from that. So in 1990, 1993, like 19, 2008, 
2002, I believe, all of these, they kept building upon what they started way back in 1990. And I think the high-speed rail, if we do that, could greatly, um, could be accomplished much more easily. And uh, I, I think we can get the ball rolling right now. But with that being said, there is still the possibility of a large private investor. And if we can get those funds, we can allocate them to the local regions as accordingly. And Adam's going to go over some domestic case studies which they were able to successfully use a large private investor, and uh, he's going to go over the possibilities of that for California. So, hi everyone, my name is Adam. I'm a political science major, senior here, graduating on the 10th, right on. <laughs> and I'm going to be going over two domestic case studies of high speed rail projects taking place in the United States. And this is going to give us kind of more a comparative approach of seeing how these projects gather their own funding, or any of these strategies of viable options for our own project in the high speed rail, California high speed rail. And the first case that we're going to be going over is Texas Central, which is a privately held company based in Texas that's undertaking the construction of a high-speed rail between Houston and Dallas. And as we can see from the preliminary projections, this will be a really beneficial project. Six million passengers are expected to ride the train annually by 2029, and over 85% of surveyed Texas travelers say they would use the train under the right circumstances. So obviously at the beginning, it's going to be a very beneficial, promising project. How are they acquiring their funding? That's the biggest question we're trying to answer. They're getting all of their funding through private funding. And that's going to be a really common theme we see throughout these case studies. For these large transportation infrastructure projects, private funding is going to have to be pursued. One of the biggest contributions of that private funding has come from a $300 million loan from the Japanese Overseas Infrastructure Investment Corporation for Transport and Urban Development. And when we look at the Japanese Overseas Investment Corporation, or for short, JOIN, we see that it's particularly intriguing for our own case in the California High Speed Rail. And this is because they have been extremely active in seeking infrastructure opportunities cross-nationally. Specifically, they look for infrastructure opportunities that are going to fulfill growing demand of something. What do I mean by this? If you look at their two most recent investments, the Coal Chains Logistics Project in Malaysia was done in of this month, actually, 2019. And they invested in this Coal Chains Logistics Project because this project was fulfilling a growing demand of halal and non-halal Coal Chains Logistics within the country. December 2018, they contributed to a new passenger terminal in an airport in Far East Russia. And this airport just happened to be at the center of one of the most growing economic and political areas of the entire region. So if anything, I think the California High Speed Rail has to reach out specifically to join, if not just other private investment firms, and contact them and pitch our project and our idea in a way that's going to fulfill this. And I just saw a recent study from um, a couple of economists from the University of Barcelona, and they, they did a huge substantial research study on high-speed rail projects throughout the entire world. Specifically in the United States, they found that the California high-speed rail had the highest demand of passenger growth through the year 2035. So there's definitely projections and numbers that we can use to reach out to join and say, hey, this has a growing demand, this is going to be a very beneficial project, can we get some help? Um, and when we look at joint decision-making process, it really resembles a lot of these private investment, private equity firms. And they make their decisions based off these components, and the biggest component, I think, is due diligence. They execute due diligence by outside specialists, they launch research on the ground, and research local partners. So while we're trying to gather funding, I think it's really important that the California High School Rail Authority reaches out to investment firms like JOIN, and they sh do their best in showing tangible evidence, like on the ground evidence, of this project becoming beneficial and really benefiting these private investment firms. And this next slide, I think, is one of the most important. I outlined five of the key infrastructure investment private equity firms that I think the California High Speed Rail Authority should reach out to. And the reason for this is because <clears throat> these five have been tenaciously active in seeking infrastructure investment opportunities within the United States. And if you look at the three on the left, KKR, Stone Peak, I Square Capital, these three on the left have invested $7 billion each in 2018. When you look at the right, Brookfield and Global Infrastructure Partners, those each invested, they earmarked upwards of $10 billion in 2019 alone. So obviously these specific private equity firms are really looking for infrastructure opportunities to invest in. I think it's really interesting for the California High Speed Rail Authority to reach out to them and just contact them, see what they're about, and see if they can um, offer any private investments. Um, and the last case study that's going to be a lot shorter is on Brightline, which is a private, another private company in Florida, and they're undertaking a high-speed rail connecting West Palm Beach to Orlando. And again, 
when you look at the preliminary projections, obviously really good numbers. Um, how are they gathering funding? Again, it's going to be through private funding. This time it's a little different. They're doing a strategic partnership with Richard Branson's Virgin Trains at USA. And because of this, they've gathered $1.8 billion in bonds to finish the railway. Um, yeah, so, um, and so I think strategic partnerships like this, specifically like public-private partnerships, are going to be really beneficial to California High Speed Rail Authority. Public partnership, public-private partnerships really help in mitigating the challenges of, for example, like cost uncertainty. And for the high speed, California High Speed Rail, we know that's been a huge problem with cost fluctuations, costs going up. Public-private partnerships, strategic partnerships really help with this because it requires transparency between both parties. So I think this is something that really could be pursued. Hypothetically, I thought about maybe BART in San Francisco. It's one of the biggest transportation companies in San Francisco. If they hypothetically partnered with the California High Speed Rail Authority, all those, if let's say the rail gets completed, all those passengers traveling from Los Angeles and the Central Valley traveling to San Francisco, that's a whole new market segment for a company like BART. So it's these kind of like strategic partnerships that I definitely think should be pursued. So that covers for the domestic case, and now I will turn it to Rowan, and she will go over the international dynamics at play. Hello, my name is Rowan. I'm a double major in political science and Middle Eastern studies with a minor in Arabic. I'm also graduating uh, May 10. And I'm going to be looking to Japan and France. I'm going to be looking to Japan and France as international case studies you know, with highly successful rail systems and lessons that are applicable to California. And I will go ahead and explain how that is. So a quick background on Japan's bullet train, also known as Shinkansen. It's the world's oldest high-speed rail system. It was inaugurated in 1964. And it began with a kind of short, about 300-mile line between Tokyo and Osaka that was eventually expanded on. And it is run by the Japan Railways Group, which was state-operated, but eventually partially privatized. And I will go a little bit later into why they privatized. Um, and it, it, they transport tens of millions of passengers all over Japan. And it grew in stages, which I will also explain why that is important later. And I was drawn to this case study because of how the, the head of the project, he was known as the member of the crazy gang, he eventually resigned out because of the scandal of the rising costs. And I think you know that's pretty applicable to what's happening with high-speed rail. But eventually, they pushed it through, and the benefits were kind of like enjoyed by people. And it wasn't now it's you know this highly respected system rather than being seen as something from the crazy game. And the benefits that I think are pretty applicable to California is, according to a study by Hiroshi Okada, who's the professor of uh, engineering in Tokyo, also a liberal Democrat politician. He said that there's about five billion. Uh, USD per year saved in uh, time, like traveling, uh, time travel, and uh, eventually it was expanded from like the line between Tokyo and Osaka all the way to the south. And Fukuoka is not on the map, but what is on the map is a very important city, Kakigawa City, and it's really important because it's pretty comparable to Central Valley towns. It's a small rural town. And you know the young students, the young people, they were leaving for college. They were just leaving to find you know, opportunities in Tokyo. They were not coming back. And eventually, the residents of Kakigawa City, once they saw the development that was happening in you know, cities along the earlier lines of the, the track, they wanted their own station. And they lobbied for it, and they pushed for it, and they raised money. They even raised their own money and also kind of got investors on board. And eventually, this resulted in a lot of development along the line, you know, industrial parks, businesses. Uh, the population ended up doubling, and this really increased tax revenue. And the mayor of Kakigawa City credited Shinkansen with saving the city, and he really urged other small towns to get on board. And I think that could absolutely happen to towns in Central Valley. And it's competitive with air, particularly when uh, the trips are short enough, you know, accounting for how long it takes to go to the airport, go through security screenings. But again, this is you know, clean, cheaper form of travel, and. And that's why I think we could definitely see it here in California. And overcoming challenges, again, I was also drawn to the fact that they had like a lot of widespread opposition from like, environmentalists, from politicians, <coughs> uh, from people who were really concerned about the, the rail being really noisy. And that was overcome. And uh, it was also, it managed to get World Bank funding, but this barely covered costs. 
and that's why they did the smaller rail at first, kind of like what we're doing. And they did eventually privatize though. It's important to know that compared to California, one of the main reasons that was given for privatization was that Japan has this declining population, so it's kind of like decreased ridership in certain areas. So I don't so I think you know California has the opposite problem, so we wouldn't have to worry about that as much. Um, and again, that initial line, it shortened people's commutes. It alleviated the housing crisis because now people could live in a smaller place and commute to Tokyo versus increasing the demand for housing in Tokyo itself. And um, the noise concerns were laid because Japan was able to kind of develop this technology, um, this levitation, like it's called like magnetic levitation, and you know, make the the nose, I guess, of the bullet train, like small enough so that it wasn't noisy and it's very strict kind of standards. So residents were, you know, comforted uh, on that. And there was development along the rail. Um, JR East, one of the regional companies uh, for the Japan National Railways Group, they actually have these businesses along the line and they take that revenue and they reinvest it back into the network. And that has been really helpful and something we can absolutely uh, replicate. And the land acquisition, it did take decades. So I think you know the problems that have been happening with land acquisition in California, it's not as bad a sign as it might seem because Japan was able to, to do that. And I think, again, very applicable to California is how about 87% of the, the rail is through like mountainous terrain. And that's, again, a big problem for us. And they were able to do that. They were able to, um, well, say within budget. So again, we could look to them for their expertise. And now moving on to, to France. Uh, some background on France's high speed rail system, TDB. It was one of the first systems in Europe. Um, it, you know, again, has increased in stages. In contrast with Shinkansen, which is, you know, kind of an important. Uh, an important difference is that it was fully compatible with existing railways, and I know that California has been really trying to pursue like blended operation. That was more possible for France, but um, and it was also flatter terrain, so it that would make it easier for them with noise concerns. But I will explain later why France is still kind of an interesting case study to look at. It has the state-owned operator financial problems, but there is like a big opposition to privatization. And I will also explain that. Uh, the benefits of it, it captured 90% of the Paris line airline business and according to Bloomberg also about 80% of the, the airline travel between uh, Paris and Bordeaux. Cheaper, easier, cleaner travel. Um, better connection of firms to suppliers. This was based on a study from the University of Pennsylvania. There was a lot of technological spillover, diffusion of ideas, and smaller cities benefited the most. And France was interesting to look at because according to a study by the German Marshall Fund, it has pretty similar urban density to LA and um, you know that big city leading into smaller cities you know, along the line and so they could, you know, we could learn from them for California. And overcoming the challenges, again, similar to the opposition to Shinkansen, you know, residents, um, environmentalists, politicians, they all had issues with it. But I think, and this is something that Japan did successfully as well, people were shown the benefits and people were kind of brought to the process, especially in France where there were meetings like associations set up with you know, local politicians, with like the, the people from their high speed rail authority. Um, and so they were able to share their concerns, they were able to like help push for standards to like, lower you know, the amount of noise that the train would cause. Um, and also, I think important to see how they acquired the land is like cities were able through like subsidies and kind of like joint development agreements set the purchasing price um, for the land, and that made it easier for the train to be built. And um, again, the the protests were diffused with people being given their say, being brought into the process, um, and there was you know, debt accrued from the system, but there was a lot of protest. People didn't want it to be privatized, and a big reason that people didn't want it to be privatized is because unions felt that this would threaten their jobs. So I think that's kind of important to look at because it showed that the rail brought a lot of jobs and people felt secure with it. So I think eventually once you have, you know, this demand for it, these people who are really seeing the value in the system, um, it makes it possible for the federal government to eventually step in. Um, so I think overall, uh, Japan is 
more useful as a case study than France um, because of mountainous terrain, because they had more uh, particularly rural cities who benefited to the extent that residents were willing to lobby for it. And um, I think if we look to them for their technology rather than reinvent the wheel, their technology for like noise reduction, uh, for again, tunneling, um, rather than reinvent the wheel, we could achieve the, some similar results faster than we can achieve. So I'm going to be talking about the political considerations, uh, specifically the opposition <coughs> from the Central Valley and possible supporters for the high speed rail. Um, so currently, Northern California and Southern California are very supportive of this project, as you guys know, but a lot of opposition is coming from the Central Valley. I'm actually from the Central Valley, I'm from a very small town called Porterville. Um, nobody even knows where it is, so I would say Fresno. Um, and I know that a lot of people in the area are just very unaware of the usefulness of the high speed rail. They don't think it's going to be used um, a lot in the, in the Central Valley. And some of their fears are obviously like not in my backyard. They don't want um, an influx of population and they're very fearful of urban sprawl. Um, most of their fears are coming from landowners and farmers who own a lot of land and they think that the High Speed Rail Authority is basically kind of an elitist like institution um, trying to basically build this project that isn't going to benefit anybody in the Central Valley at all. Um, and specifically, there is a coalition called uh, the Citizens for California High Speed Rail Accountability and it's formed by a group of farmers in Kings County and they list 13 orgs specifically <coughs> critical of the high speed rail and also on their website they have a mail address for complaints and they have lists of like court actions they've taken part in and also like california high speed rail victims um and also very specific opponents to the high speed rail are assemblyman vince fong from bakersfield he recently introduced um, assembly bill 435 on february 11th um, which will prohibit new bonds from being sold to fund the high speed rail um, and that would be coming from private funding. And then also Congressman Kevin McCarthy, um, he's a representative who represents Kern and Tulare counties. He's introduced H.R. 1600, uh, the Railway Act on March 7th. And this will basically redirect the 3.5 federal funding from, um, yeah, from federal funds that Trump wants back. Basically he wants to redirect this for water construction water like conservation projects um so i think even though the central valley brings up a lot of like local concerns i think we can frame this in more of like a regional way um basically their fear that like urban sprawl is going to take over rural lands but if we implement smart growth which is kind of a type of like new urbanism um basically Smart growth shows that housing can be kind of contained like in the line of a high speed rail and that communities can be formed along the high speed rail in like existing cities already so that the influx of population won't actually lead to like increased housing and like sprawl throughout the land. Um, and millennials actually prefer to live in denser compact areas with mass transit so smart growth would actually appeal to the younger generation there's like a large um, age gap in this obviously in the opposition um, and i think that smart growth would help to align local regional and state goals um, and it would so solve the housing transportation and climate crises um, by basically just making sure that traffic is reduced and also towns in the central valley are very dispersed um you have to drive like 30 minutes 40 minutes to get from each town so i think the high speed rail would actually benefit the regional community a lot because they could take the high speed rail to different towns instead of having to drive like 30 minutes so it would actually reduce a lot of traffic um 
And also supporters of the high speed rail and smart growth see light rail as the most sustainable way um, to prepare for projected urban growth, which they've talked about, is basically inevitable at this point. So where are my further support lie? Um, a survey by Technometrica basically said that two thirds of respondents would use high speed rail if available today. And Americans overwhelmingly support efforts to streamline government regulations to promote real estate near the high speed rail. Um, Smart growth organizations are basically these ones outlined here. And Senators Charles Schumer, Diane Feinstein, and Jim Beale are very supportive of increased infrastructure funding in general. Um, as they've talked about private funding options, federal funding is obviously necessary for any large infrastructure project. And um, the new Democratic coalition basically they say that they're willing to work with anyone to revitalize our nation's infrastructure and um, re some relevant California legislators that are members of the New Democratic Co Coalition are Jim Costa, and he's from the Central Valley, from Fresno, Madera, and Merced counties. Um, Southern California, Lou Correa, Tony Cardenas, Adam Schiff, Norma Torres, and Julia Brownlee. And also some regional civic business groups that are in support are the Fresno Economic Development Court. Um, so Leanne Eager, um, she's actually the president and CEO of Fresno Economic Development Court. She's a, a lifelong Fresno resident and she was asked to write a paper for the US Secretary of Commerce, Wilbur Ross, detailing the advantage and advantages and opportunities. And she has cited that because of the high speed rail, Fresno has already experienced a 400% growth in jobs. And specifically, um, the high speed rail authority is working with 407 small businesses engaged, 108 are from the Central Valley. And they're also hiring a lot of veterans and a lot of um, disadvantaged workers specifically for this project. So, she is like a really big supporter of this. And California Forward is um, basically partnering with the California Economic Summit. And the 2019 Economic Summit is actually gonna be on November 7th and 8th, and it's actually gonna be held in Fresno. And I think that we should invite all the opponents and all these groups that are opposed to the high speed rail, all these like coalitions with farmers, and also all the supporters that I've mentioned so far, and basically propose the high-speed rail as a framework for like future growth, not just for California, but for the whole country, because population growth is inevitable, and this could solve the housing crisis, and the climate crisis, and the transportation crisis that they've all outlined already. Um, and so I think that this is like a really great space to be utilized for future subcommittee formation or coalition formation that they've already talked about. Hi, my name is Honor and I'll be talking about environmental obstacles and possible solutions. So some of the main obstacles include land acquisition, uh, especially in the Central Valley. There are 1,900 properties that need to be acquired in the Central Valley, and it was originally estimated to be $332 million to acquire that land, uh, but now it's estimated at $1.5 billion, and this is largely due to lawsuits, so that's a very big problem with high speed rail. Uh, another problem is mountains. Mountains also create a lot of costs, and there's a lot of mountain ranges um, in the path of the high-speed rail, such as the San Gabriel Mountains, the Teochapi Mountains, and the Diablo Mountains. Uh, costs can go up from $42 million per mile to $400 million. Uh, for example, the Baltimore Red Line, which had this problem with mountains where they have to make tunnels, uh, uh, it costs around $200 uh, million per mile. There's also been some environmentalist pushback. There's been concern about <coughs> endangered species and whether uh, high-speed rail will increase collision deaths and possibly threaten their livelihood. And there's also been lawsuits about whether the high-speed rail will be used to transport oil that is um, obtained from fracking. So in order to finish the high-speed rail in a timely manner, 
will need to really buckle down and fast track its construction. And I think that this is possible because the red tape can be cut when the government wants to. And here's a few examples of that. In 2011, the Obama administration fast-tracked the building of electric transmission lines. He did this because of uh, the environmental benefits that he believed it had. And based on that, I would argue that the high-speed rail would merit such exemptions because it would reduce the use of fossil fuels. And ideally, Governor Newsom would make this call. Another relevant example, and a very interesting one, is uh, uh, the Rams Chargers complex. And the high speed, because the high speed rail has been delayed time and time again because of its environmental review. Uh, most recently, it's been postponed to 2020. But again, we'll see if that actually happens by that date. However, the new LA Rams stadium got completely around this obstacle, despite the fact that the California Environmental Quality Act requires them to do a, an environmental review. The Rams were able to get around this by using a loophole that exempts projects that are from ballot initiatives from going through the rigorous environmental review process, which I thought was very interesting because High Speed Rail was actually a ballot initiative. So this might be useful, but then again, the environmental review process has already started. But all in all, the government is capable of making the completion of the High Speed Rail easier, but we will need political support. It's one thing to sell a sports stadium and another thing to fundamentally change statewide transportation. So in order to gain political support that we need to fast track the high speed rail, we must bring in uh, environmental groups to the table. And even though there have been uh, a few lawsuits uh, concerning environmentalists, the support is promising. Surfrider is a key supporter. Christopher Evans, the executive director of the San Clemente chapter, has met with the High Speed Rail Authority when they visited San Diego and was an enthusiastic supporter and wanted to advise them to not use a coastal route to preserve the beaches. So it tells me that they do have some concerns, but they are willing to work with us. Uh, the Sierra Club stated that, quote, as we work to reduce air pollution from mobile sources, we must continue to identify and invest in more transportation options, such as high-speed rail, that have the potential to reduce air pollution and magic congestion, end quote. As the high-speed rail would reduce fossil fuels, environmental organizations are sympathetic to the cause. So potential members of the coalition uh, that I've listed here as well include the Californians Against Waste, Environmental Protection Information Center, and the Friends of the Dunes. I also think that involving groups at the local level is very important. An example of local level involvement is the Coalition for Sustainable Rail in Minnesota. They partner with the University of Minnesota to develop sustainable locomotive engineering. And following this as a model, I propose that we involve local universities and use the experience of environmental groups to build the high-speed rail as efficiently as possible in the most sustainable way possible. This way, we do what is right for the environment and gain political support along the way. Also, due to the commercial benefits of the high-speed rail, we should also look to business interests. And a very important uh, business-friendly group in Sacramento is the Moderate Democratic Caucus, led by Assemblyman Jim Cooper and Assemblyman Rudy Salas. And there is no official roster of this group, so I think that the leaders are really where we should go to. Assemblyman Cooper voted for high-speed rail funding, but Assemblyman Salas did not. Uh, but not all hope is lost. Uh, Rudy Salas said that if high-speed rail is forced upon us, then we need to refine the plan for high-speed rail. The legislature figured out how to build a $7 billion Bay Bridge in San Francisco and a new football stadium in Los Angeles. Surely we can figure out how to build a project that serves the needs of the valley and the state without damaging communities. So although there isn't full-fledged support, he acknowledges that both the legislature can do it and that uh, the practices need to be improved. So I think that uh, we should listen. And I would imagine this coalition uh, advising the project and helping gain support and overcome obstacles in a productive manner. As the carbon dioxide levels pose a threat to our survival, we will be pushed towards a low carbon economy. Uh, a switch to a low carbon economy has economic incentives too. 
Uh, as it is estimated that over the next 20 years, switching to a low carbon economy would save the US $1.8 trillion. And this change, I believe, will give pressure towards the high speed rail. Also, the Green New Deal is something that's being talked about a lot and includes building high speed rail. The Green New Deal seeks to, quote, build out high speed rail at a scale where air travel stops becoming necessary, create affordable public transit available to all with the goal to replace every combustion engine vehicle. And the Green New Deal is important because it actually has a lot of political support. The Green New Deal has received nine Senate sponsors and more than 60 House sponsors, and every Senate Democrat who has declared a run for president in 2020 has endorsed it. And a survey conducted by Yale found that 92% of Democrats and 64% of Republicans support the, the Green New Deal plan. So we really need to invigorate the issue of the California High Speed Rail. Rebranding and remarketing the, the High Speed Rail as part of the Green New Deal could help its case, as Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the progressives are getting a lot of positive attention right now. I believe that the support is there, but it's been so long, so many delays and disappointments that we really need something to pick the momentum back up. So in terms of our policy recommendations, we're proposing that one, uh, we need to reapproach the high-speed rail from a smaller scale, working with each city through local integrative systems that promote business, while also looking for larger scale uh, funding sources in the background. And from the case studies, uh, we've learned that developmental development deals al along the line need to be uh, created. Uh, we need to do outreach campaigns, explore uh, public-private partnerships, partner with, uh, partnering with Japan is also a possibility uh, to deal with the issues of noise reduction and tunnel building. And also thirdly, uh, we're proposing forming a coalition to ad advise the project to, and to co-op support, along with overall rebranding and bridging the gap between the popularity of the Green New Deal and the high-speed rail. Thank you, that's our presentation. Okay, great, good job, guys. Well done, well done. Um, if it's all right with Steve, Steve, can we put the, the students around the table and make this more of a, uh, a little more comfortable environment? So we'll grab a couple chairs here. And we've got about 20 minutes or so to continue our discussion. And we can certainly start with Steve, but we can open this up to anyone who would like to um, ask any questions and whoever would like to respond, you're all welcome to do so. So let me just start with, and you all jump in. I'm going to start with a third of macro question. Um, and as Art said, anybody can answer, but maybe all of you. And, it, and it's like, I mean, obviously, you're sort of coming from the sort of advocating for high speed rail, mm -hmm. but trying to force you to take a step back after doing all this study. And, you know, as far as I can tell, you guys know more about high speed rail than I do, probably not <laughs> more than Camden and, and Steve. Um, but do you guys, do you think it's actually a good idea? Like, sort of like, co like cone silence kind of, kind of place. If that reference even means anything. Are we going to go down the line? Like no, yeah, I'm just oh, jumping. Just just yeah. Yeah. I think starting out, I thought, for my first instinct was there's no way that this can be built. Like, I wasn't coming from a point of, is it worthwhile? Just saying there's no way. Like, the possibility isn't there. Because I think a big part of that's the media attention. I mean, everywhere you look, every article you read, it's like, no, this is bad. Like, $100 billion failure, like, corruption. You read all these things, and you're like, all right, this thing's a waste of time. But then once you start... Hey, just to, to note on this, probably the first month in, yeah. that's how the presentation was going. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, 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 we're not going there. You find a way to make this look yeah. Yeah. like it's plausible. Yeah. But once I, th I think once you start reading, like, the benefits, and then you start... Like for me, the big thing that I thought of was when I thought about the LA Metro, what if we were here today and we didn't take that first step in 1990? I mean, just that not, okay, well, like we can't pay for it. We just push ourselves back like 30 years and because we're able to start building and look where we're at now, we have like a fully integrative transportation system. And the studies I think show that high-speed rail is gonna be the future. I mean, it has to be the future at this point. So I think, 
the best way going forward is not, we shouldn't be thinking of, can we build this thing? It's like, how can we just start building? Like any way we can just start getting this thing on the ground. Because if we don't do it now, I think we're gonna miss our chance and within the next couple of years. That's and, my opinion. Yeah. Uh, to build on that, I, I think, again, it has to happen. I think the benefits of it are too important, too quick to pass up. And I mean, I read that like scathing auditors before, and I understand, you know, kind of all the issues with it. But I mean, personally, I'm an example of someone who would be having housing in LA if it wasn't for the train. I take the train from Ranch Cucamonga, um, and, you know, it's because I couldn't afford like, the rent around here. And that has been, cute. like, I can't imagine how I would get to school without it. And, you know, looking at how Japan has benefited from Japan especially, I'm like, well, they had like a lot of the same problems. Like they literally, like someone resigned, just like what happened with the high speed authority because everyone was like, it's an out of control budget. But, and they, and it's not even as dire for them because their population is shrinking. We have this huge population. Anyone who goes and takes the highway and sees that traffic, like I think it's really clear that like this is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. So it's, we need it. <laughs> Yes, um, California right now, its current infrastructure is 100% is not sustainable. Um, I, I believe Gavin Newsom estimated the cost of revitalizing the entire infrastructure system anywhere from, I think it was like 700 billion to 900 and something billion. Um, and that's not including a high speed rail system. Um, so when you look at the overall cost of it, um, especially with the, with the population growth, depending on which estimates you look at, let's just say 10, 10 million in the next uh, 20 years, um, or 30 years or so. Um, and, and what's happening is because of the, the housing crisis is, is it's all being focused into the Central Valley. So now you're gonna have a huge population growth in the Central Valley, which is already being struck by the highest rates of unemployment, of child poverty, of, uh, un of uh, families below the poverty line. Um, and, and when you take into that account, you, you see that we really need to do something that's going to facilitate um, a way, one, for uh, interregional travel um, to expand the labor markets. And, all, and also when you're looking at it, you can look at it as um, the benefits are on, on three different stages. There's around the station areas, there's in the urban centers, and there's also the regional um, development effects. And so when you take into all of those in account what it would cost to um, build onto the existing highways, um, I think it's definitely more cost effective in the long run, although it might not seem like it. Doesn't that beg the question a little bit? I mean, you, you said that we already were looking at $100 billion for infrastructure you know, resolution. Now we need another $100 billion. Um, wouldn't we be better off just ditching the train altogether and putting money into things that are currently being used like roads and trestles and we can't build enough bridges. Roads. We can't build enough, uh, enough roads to, to support the growing population. And also our, our, um, our roads, our infrastructure last year was rated a D. It's the, in the top three worst infrastructures in, in the country. Um, so that's just, that's not gonna be adding on to it. That's gonna be um, re redoing a lot of it, re reconstructing a lot of the infrastructure. Um, I don't know if someone said this, but does anyone know the total cost of some of the other high-speed rail? Projects? Yeah, so I apologize, I forgot to mention that. Apologies, it's okay. But the Texas Central one is around 15 billion. 15 or 15? 15 billion. Yeah. Okay. Um, but it doesn't go as far. It yeah. doesn't go as far. It's yeah, what's that mileage between? I'm not and sure dollars. the exact mileage, okay. but it, it's definitely shorter than San Francisco, Los okay. Angeles. Brightline in Florida is, it ranges, it's like 3 billion to 10 billion. Okay. So it's, um, obviously they're a lot more cheaper than the California High Speed Rail, but sure. it's, out of all the high speed rail projects in the United States, they're definitely the most substantial. So with JOIN, because I'm actually really interested with that, yeah. do you know what um, they were asking for the rate of return for the investment? I'm not sure about the rate of return. That would be um, interesting to find yeah. out. Um, uh, the only thing they had on their website when I looked into it was they specifically look projects for like growing demand of something. And obviously when you have a growing demand of something, you're going to get a high rate of return. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, and, but you know, I think, it's so easy to say that for the California High Speed Rail too, because you're connecting two of the largest economies in the United States. I mean, you have the Silicon Valley, and Los Angeles is one of like the most growing tech startup places also in the United States, yeah. next to like New York. So I mean, like it, it's just a matter of time. Like when you have that interconnected system between San Francisco and Los Angeles, 
the stimulation of economic growth would be so substantial. So I think you could definitely make the case for that as well. Yeah, and I think we talked about this before. I don't know if you were there, but foreign investors are uh, particularly in the Asian countries are like interested in investment opportunities in the states because we owe them so much money, so they want to jack up their greater return for that. Yeah. So it's not bad. It's a really interesting. Um, definitely. Idea. Yeah. Also, last question from me. Um, speed to project completion for most interested in the Texas one. So they got the money, they're able to do it. How fast are they getting it done? Um, it should be done by 2020, 2020. And when they start? 2000, I want to say 16, 17. Well, so that's, do they have the same, I guess, terrain? I'm assuming no. A lot, it's a lot flatter. Flatter, it's really yeah. Because you have so many passengers just driving back and forth between yeah. Houston and Dallas and all the time. And it's not super mountainous. So it's definitely, yeah. So the, California. The, the, the California one's very, the terrain's a lot different than Houston and Dallas. Is I think it was 2016, 2017, it was around there. And forgive me, I've not been to Japan, but wouldn't California's terrain be more similar to the, their terrain with all the mountains? That's what I yeah. what, And what was that total cost? Or was it it's so segmented that you... It was segmented in the initial one, I want to say like 80 million loan from the World Bank, barely covered costs. Okay. Um, and that was like about 300 miles. And that was a loan they, were, they paid back? Um, I'm actually, I'm actually not sure. Okay. But it was a loan from the whole thing. Yeah. Is, is that an option for California high speed rail? I don't think so, but I think that's what I really liked about Adam's suggestion about from Japan rather than the world of private equity. Yeah. yeah. I think personally, like from what I found, like these large transportation infrastructure projects, you're going to have to get some type of private investment. Yeah. You um, have to invest in And like that. over the past like decade, there's been like a huge increase in like private investment, private equity involvement in infrastructure projects, um, specifically like public private partnerships. Um, I think it would be really beneficial. And I honestly don't believe, I think it's going to be necessary for this particular project. For me personally, like when I look at this, I think it's easy to get caught up, like I was saying, like into the San Francisco, LA, like it has to be connected. Mm -hmm. But I think like we kind of lose like a humanism with it. And like these cities in like the Central Valley can greatly benefit. I mean, these economic, these environmental benefits aren't just if we can get it to LA to San Francisco. I mean, I would, like I know it's easy to pick on like oh we just have like a sitting uh, Central Valley section doesn't connect anywhere. But these people are still gonna experience some economic growth. Their cities, are, their urban cities are gonna grow still. So I think if you kind of if you like if you have to get some big private investor, obviously. You, you like set yourself up for disappointment, and then like if you can only build this part, like oh, this is a total failure. But I think if we just keep building small and like really focusing on the cities, I mean, you can kind of. It doesn't have to be a huge loan that we have to get. It can be in sections. It can be smaller loans from a lot of different people. Um, well, and I thought that was interesting when talking about rebranding it, particularly when you were saying that folks in the Central Valley were so against it from an economic opportunity, which mm -hmm. to, or from sorry from a for people, not my backyard opportunity. But what I see is it's actually a huge economic opportunity to get them to actually be able to get jobs in epicenters like San Francisco, Los Angeles, and areas that actually have huge issues. Um, I only know this because that's the first class that I was in, but with actually keeping people because the housing markets are so ridiculous. Yeah, yeah to add to that, the reason why I was so interested with how they funded that initial section wasn't because of like the World Bank itself so much as I think it's comparable to that stretch of the Central Valley. Well, right now it's basically, it's going to be built. It is, they've found the funding for it. And I think right now the focus should be on the development around it. Like once you can get like some businesses there, once you can, again, like you have to show people the results. So I think once you focus on that, it makes it could attract private investment later for others. I think Bakersfield just now, like recently, approved a big like transportation kind of what I was saying, like a hub. Yeah. Their plan is going through the like local government. Yeah. So we're gonna see some. I think we're gonna see some good economic growth in what? Bakersfield. Carissa. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of the lack of support comes from just like a lack of information because obviously like the high speed rail authority doesn't really know how they're fully going to fund it or build it yet so that's why there's like not a lot of information but yeah i think if you like spread like disseminated a lot of information about like 
like this is how we're gonna do it and we can use like smart growth and we can develop along here and like also outline all the economic like benefits that are gonna happen. I think it's just like a matter of like letting rural like rural folks know like like that it is gonna benefit them. Because they right now like they just have like no idea. Yeah. Like, they is it the, is it the sense go. that basically the big cities in the state are just trying to drive this and we don't really care about it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they think that they're not going to benefit Steve, from is that your sense? Out. I'm wondering what your your sort of yeah, point I mean, is. I mean, and, and at a broader level, it's it feels like a, increasingly sort of that PR yeah. state, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just like there's you know that was part of the problem with what Newsom did in his state of the state, um, you know, and and now they're talking about you know there's and I thought it was really funny because I felt like basically the first day we got together, there was like stuff about this like super in the news, yeah. and then today there's a front page story in the LA Times about it. So to give you guys the, it's still the sense of the dynamic. I'm so dynamic. sorry to interrupt. We have another group that's booked the space. It's us. Yeah. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> I guess, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, so, so that, I mean, the PR. Kind of name right now. They're talking about like, oh, we're gonna, you know, we're going to reduce the consultants level, and we're going to kind of get control over things. And, and you know, talk, you know, I talked to Camden a little bit yesterday and this morning, and the sense of that is, you know, trying to, you know, or you know, is that trying to sort of start shifting the narrative a little bit? Mm -hmm. But it feels increasingly that like people don't know where Newsom is. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. I'm not sure Newsom knows where Newsom is. I feel like a lot of what you all mm -hmm. talked about should appeal to him, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and like, you know, taking that bold step, you know, it's it's either, you know, every every moment you delay it's <coughs> an idea of Metro here mm -hmm. in LA, if we hadn't done it, mm -hmm. now it would cost, you yeah. know, 100 billion or whatever, yeah. it would be probably something similar. Um, and, you know, it, it felt a little bit like where he said, like, we're gonna, we're gonna do this for the Central Valley. Some of was sort of pushing towards that, but then he hasn't necessarily follow it up and that feels like something that's something about Newsom I think if the public knew the facts they'd be extremely scared like the reason he has no plan is because there's a huge gap there's like 60 billion dollar gap and there's nowhere to find that money that's why he's kind of like playing it off it's like oh no big deal we'll, we'll find a way but if people knew like how bad it actually is I mean, look, if you think about it right if you take a segment like you guys have suggested do the rebranding and se segment this in a way and just be successful yeah mm -hmm. from yeah. from a small portion all of a sudden, you're going to get private investors and start to think, you know yeah. what? It worked there, so let, I want to go grab the next section. I want to go. Then you get Silicon Valley that says, well, why wouldn't we want to go from Merced yes. to San Jose? My question, though, because it's something we talked about, I think, in the first meeting, was that, and I was kind of surprised it wasn't taken from the presentation, was Google's Google as a stakeholder, because they bought all that land in the Central Valley. And so why aren't they working with I don't know. I think they need, they need more um, evidence that it's going to work out because Google doesn't have the land in the Central Valley. They also just bought um, a bunch of land around the San Jose station. Yeah. Um, so having two hubs, centers in, in two of the, the, the big stations uh, would greatly be beneficial to them. But I think what they're waiting for is just confirmation first that, you know, this isn't just going to be a total waste of money. Um, and I think what, what that comes with is the, the the authority needs to be more transparent and also it needs to be very proactive um, in in public policy and making sure that the, um, the the cities along the along the path of the of the of the rail also receive the benefits. So it's not just you know LA on one side and San Francisco on one side. A lot of my research was on the redistribution of benefits, and um, you saw in Japan, there was a specific line in Japan from uh, Tokyo to uh, whatever the blanking on the name of its old the, the old capital, like back in Empire times. But like <laughs> whatever, whatever that's that, technical. That's technical. Whatever, whatever that whatever the city is. So it was in that quarter, in that there was um, 15 stops, and in the very beginning, there was they were seeing a lot of um, development effects along all the intermediate stops as well. But then they implemented a um, uh, an express line that skipped 11 out of those 15. And what you saw was a, a bunch of people started taking those, and then they saw that they could make money, more money off of those. 
and became more about making the money instead of making sure that the intermediate cities were getting the developmental effects. Um, and so then now a majority of that line is the express line and then you've seen um, a complete shift from what was uh, happening in the beginning to now it's just Tokyo and uh, other city on the other side. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, those are the ones uh, receiving the main benefits. And so when you apply that to California, I think with transparency and also just being very proactive with public policy and making sure that you know we're not we're not running this thing, um, we're running it as much, with the goal of um, improving all, like the the entire uh, state of California, not just the global business sphere, but making sure that you know the Central Valley and, and all the cities along the way get the the development that they need to support the population growth and the in the um, growing industries there. So, so uh, I have a question. Like you, you have you know three I think interesting policy proposals at the end. You know, smaller scale local development deals along the lines kind of tied to public private partnerships, and then the coalition to advise and, and build support. I'm wondering if you've given thought to how like sequencing that, or you know how like I mean, how you would put those. Together and do like a whole. I think the first step would be you have to break up the high, like not break up the high school, you have to allocate subcommittees. Because right now you have one body trying to make decisions for, like for all of California. So I think if you map out certain regions with like maybe two cities like that are connected, put one committee there with like local officials on, in the committee, high school HSR members. And then you start planning like smaller and then they can start allocating and trying to build those coalitions within. So I think the first step is to just like, you have to bring this thing down. Like it's just way too big. Once you scale it down, then you can start like, how are we gonna build this thing from this city to this city? Like what coalitions are needed for that section? And really like emphasize those points rather than trying to make like all decisions at one time. And then when you break up the route like that, what you're saying like city to city, it's gonna seem like a more a viable option for private investors and it's gonna seem more feasible when it's broken down to that. It just not only like aesthetically looks more feasible but just more promising because it's not it's not too big of a commitment. And local private investors look better too. Like if you have a investor in LA who wants to help out like LA to San Diego, that looks better than like Silicon Valley trying to come and pay for this thing down right. here. Yeah. And each city right. each section get its own like little not a little bit like multiple investors from that region, which really. And do you think feel like what Newsom has done at this point with his Central Valley? I mean, is that? I don't think he's part of it. I, mean, I, I, don't, I think he's. That, I think he has sort of the right idea. Right now, he's just focusing on the rail, and he's looking at this as one section of the big part. Mm -hmm. Right now, he's not focusing on like, hey, let's build Bakersfield. Like he's not doing that. Yeah. I think he could improve if he really starts focusing on this rail, like focusing on building up Bakersfield and like Merced in these cities rather than thinking of this like, okay, it's one piece of San Francisco to LA rail, so it doesn't mean much. So he's sort of, it feels like, and I mean, just as like maybe a way then to try to package this all, yeah. is that he's he's kind of done what I'm gonna call, you know, proposal one, I don't mm -hmm. really wanna phase one. Them or whatever. Phase one, it's not, like, it's like half a phase yeah, one. Yeah, you know, but then what you, but it's not done in the way that you're thinking about it. Yeah. So you go and go, this is great, but you should be thinking about it, this way, in terms of you like know, one part on of the whole, that, yeah. and then let's build a, around, you know, let's build around this first line with, you know, and get some local investors, and part of that being the, you know, building up advocacy. It feels yeah. like there's this, it feel, like, not on purpose by him, but he's yeah. set it up. And it's not, it's not, it's not it's, I think it's the fault of like what this thing is built up to be. It's kind of like you've kind of created a monster mm -hmm. where it's like so big that anything in between is a failure. Like yeah. if, if we had the metro rail and we only built one line, and people use that line, I mean, I would view that as a success better than nothing. But if you look at, oh, we didn't build 20 more, so we failed. Right. I mean, he's well, trying- to be honest, when, when metro was first built, everyone's like, this is serving some few communities, but yeah. look at it now, and look at it 20 years from now. Yeah. Right, right? it'll be yeah. pretty substantial. Yeah. So I do need to stop us here, it's about 10 to 12. Um, obviously, Steve, you'll get all the research from the students in their papers. Um, I think y'all did a really good job. I really do. I think it really came together at the end. I want to thank everyone. For yeah, that. no, I, I agree. No, I, I was telling Art, telling Megan, I told Cannon, you know, my, you know, I, I'm trying to think about done like eight, I've like been part of eight to ten of these. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was 
kind of anticipated that you guys were going to crash and burn. Just because, <laughs> because, because there's that support you were looking for. No, but just because of the dynamic nature of this. Yeah, right? yeah. And, and, but I also thought that despite that, that it was that it was probably going to be the best experience, or at least the most real world. Mm -hmm. And I hope it was the latter part of that. But you certainly there was no crashing and burning here. I think there's a lot of interesting pieces. You know what's dynamic about this is you know. For all we know, next week something could have happened that like all of this would be like, okay, we gotta start over again. We that's call cool. that a new research. Yeah, project. at least it's <laughs> that's just the way this, you know, that's the way sort of the worst public policy can be, which is like really yep. crazy. Right. Um, but if you've gotten your arms around this one, you know, a lot of other stuff is you know, way easier to to manage and to think about and you know, kind of and to pull together. So I mean that. It was a really good job. Yeah. I had really low expectations, so you did really great. Yeah. But no, I mean, it, it was it was really good. I think on something that was really, you know, tough to piece together and decide what you know what to focus on. So it was really good. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Good job. Yeah.